Good morning. Yet again this week, the country has been rocked by another mass shooting. If the deregulation of guns and the free sale without background checks of guns could keep us safe, we should be the safest country in the world by now. But we are not. Firearms cannot be the cornerstone on which we base our nation. You cannot build community around guns. Eight of these candles are still burning for the eight people shot down in Atlanta last week. We've added two more to symbolize the lives lost in Boulder, gunned down while they were shopping for food. How long, O oh Lord, how long will we remain in this self-inflicted captivity? How long will, be, will we be held by the gun lobby? How long until our elected leaders can keep us safe, can choose to hear the will of the people, to hear us speaking of the Prince of Peace whose light burns here? May God grant us wisdom and courage. May their names be a blessing. And may we be prompted by the Holy Spirit to take action. Please pray with me. We ask you to comfort the families grieving, the children now fatherless, motherless, the homes that are forever broken. Wake up those who govern, and God save the people. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every heart be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and redeemer. For the flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of God endures forever. Amen. I am reminded of the passage from Isaiah that teaches us that God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And I invite you to join me now in examining today's lesson. The title of this sermon is inspired by a Robert Burns poem. To a Mouse, it's called. Burns was part of the New Light movement of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland in the 17th century. The New Light movement offered people a way out of their fear. If they were Calvinists that were preoccupied with predestination and went to bed every night worried that God did not love them enough to make them part of the elect. Robert Burns and the New Light movement said, come and be this kind of Presbyterian with us. We are Christians, and we are going to center our teaching and our study and our worship on justice and ethics and morals, and above all, be led by the agape, agape love of Jesus Christ. Burns argued that lived experiences of God far outweighed any church rule, doctrine, or tradition. Personal experiences of God. Evidently, he had one so real, he could not ignore it. Have you ever had one of those? I have. You will forever be changed. You have to pray your way to it. You, you can't rush it. You can't just turn it on, at least for me. Probably some people claim they can. You have to be mindful and patient. 
And I'm a firm believer that in my experience anyway, the Holy Spirit cannot resist a human being that is truly vulnerable and open, whose heart is willing to change. Please do not wait for your life to fall apart before you try searching for God. You may find God through scripture or through the natural world. Some people uh, claim that the unexpected gust of hope is all they need to feel like they can go on some more to become closer to the source that made them. Sometimes a hummingbird reminds me of the Holy Spirit or the love of an old friend. When you are awestruck, claim it. When you have that gust of wonder that comes over you, claim its power. Observe it. Stay in it as long as you can because it will pass. Just like when Moses wanted to look at God up on the mount, God said, no, I'm too much for you, and passed by. That's how those feelings happen. They pass by. But while they're there, claim them. I wonder if Moses was like me. I can't, well, I hope not. But I wonder if Moses' memory was like mine. I, I can I can remember having the feeling of God being present in my life and doing something really even tangible. But I don't stay in that feeling. I remember the feeling, but I don't have it anymore. And I can't reconjure it to suit my will. While working outside Robert Burns inadvertently, while plowing a field, demolished the home of a small mouse. And that, for him, was the inbreaking moment of the Holy Spirit. On the spot, the story goes, Burns composed his poem, the full title of which is, <clears throat> To a mouse on turning her up in her nest with the plow, November 1785, and here are a few lines. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes you startle at me, your poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal. But mouse, you are not alone in proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men go oft awry and leave us nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. Riding into Jerusalem without saying a word, Jesus wrestles the narrative away from the judgmental Pharisees and the fear-mongering Roman Empire. The people cheer for the promise of joy they feel, a new Messiah, a king. They wave palms that symbolize his impending kinghood, king of Israel. But Jesus isn't that kind of king. In fact, John's gospel uniquely transforms Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem into a corrective. In response to the crowd shouting accolades for the king of Israel, Jesus, riding on the donkey, he chooses to redefine power. Jesus redefines what it means to be powerful in this world. He is not a warrior king. He does not arrive on a steed or in a chariot or with a gun or with a sword. He is the humble king. The one prophesied by Zechariah in Zechariah's ninth chapter, riding an ass, showing us the way toward abundant life. Wrap your mind around that. 
Like the poem Cat and Leo read earlier, Jesus is rarely what we expect. He's never where we're looking. He's rarely what we pray for. But He is always what we need. I would have loved to see the bonding that took place when Jesus met the donkey. You know, the disciples went and borrowed a donkey for Jesus to ride into town. Can you imagine? I know they had a moment before he climbed on. Hi, little donkey. It's just you and me. We're either riding right into their trap or we're going to change the world. It was like Jesus was engaging in ancient Near Eastern rabbinical performance art, riding into town on something completely inappropriate, saying nothing. Then following Jesus must mean that we are to be like him. How do we ride into town with him? How can we go unprotected, little old me, into a neighborhood where pain is great and risk is real? He has already gone before. My friend John is a middle-aged, very successful businessman here in the Bay Area. He attends church faithfully out of respect for his mother. She is Filipino and she believes in the Catholic Church very much. She says that the family that prays together stays together and therefore John will go with her to Mass. This week, my husband Lou and I happened upon John and it seemed like he had been waiting to speak with me. He wanted to talk about the recent Vatican statement, which for me was no big news. I understand it is big news for a lot of people and there's been lots of hand wringing and outrage online. That recent Vatican statement really just solidified what they've always said, I thought. But then at the end of it, there was something new. Someone with issues, evidently, was it the Pope, added the line that same-sex marriages are not just sinful. They didn't use that word. They said that same-sex marriages are sin. I want to be really clear to any young person, especially out there who is grappling with your sexual identity or your sexual orientation or any of that, human sexuality. What the Vatican said was misinformed and it is wrong. That doesn't make them bad people. They will eventually get there. Even in today's reading, the Pharisees, who the Vatican statement really does kind of resonate with, the Pharisees say, well, look, this it doesn't matter. Everything we're doing doesn't even matter anymore. Everybody is following Jesus. Everybody's following the guy who preaches unconditional love, who talks to sinners and the outcasts and eats with the lepers. That's the Jesus that I want you to hear about. And if you need someone to speak with, call me. Send me an email. Get in touch with me. I'm all over Facebook. I share too much. <laughs> so for John to say the family that prays together stays together really was an insult because according to the Vatican statement of a couple weeks ago, my family doesn't exist. John's family doesn't exist. How can we pray and stay when we are sin? So um, let's be clear. The Presbyterian Church USA does not discriminate against LGBTQ people, not on paper anyway. Of course, there are attitudes and minds and hearts that need softening. But you can find a place here. Come to Calvary.
We will love you. John said that the Vatican statement made him feel ashamed. That he felt actual shame because the church, which represents God in the Catholic tradition, I think, the church said, your relationship is sin. Your love is sin. Up until then, the church, the Catholic church, had been pretending to move in a direction toward acceptance, like Jesus walking on the Emmaus Road, just shows up and meets you where you are. What's worse, John's family remained silent. And this is what breaks my heart. When unchallenged hate speech, whether it's racist or homophobic or whatever, when that happens, yes, an alarm goes off in my heart. And you must address it. You cannot let it be there. You don't have to go off on somebody and embarrass them and yourself. Just address it with love and assume that everybody is created in God's image and everybody has a seed of undefilable goodness in them. I told John that I suppose that churches that did all the judging and didn't leave that to God, really didn't have a lot of need for God. If you read the Gospels, you will notice that Jesus Christ never calls for an ethics or morals consult with any church leader, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, any of the authorities. Experiences, though, an experience like Robert Burns of transcendence, that is what defines our path. The inbreaking love of God that will outweigh and shadow over all of the mean rules, all of the false doctrines and the mistaken traditions. When any church defames the gospel of Jesus Christ and makes it a social club for only these kind of people, <laughs> they defame all of Christianity. So that's why I'm talking about the Catholic Church, not to say, oh, we're so much better. No, we have all suffered from that. And when the Presbyterian Church or the United Church of Christ or MCC, when any of the other churches make mistakes or misguided statements, it harms the Catholic Church. It harms all of Christianity. These words of Reinhold Niebuhr drive it home. The fact is that more people in our modern era are irreligious because religion has failed to make civilization ethical than because it has failed to maintain intellectual responsibility. For every person who disavows religion because it seems ancient and unrevised in its dogma out, and it outrages their intelligence, several more become irreligious because the social impotence of religion outrages their conscience. You are a person of morals. If your morals are offended by your church, find another one. The agape love of Jesus Christ comes free of conditions, and it must be embodied and experienced fully. Such is the ministry into which I have the very happy honor of being called at Calvary. I am the advisory member of the Board of Deacons and as such, I have witnessed the work of Jesus Christ through their hands and feet and heart and computers and cars and everything. They are an amazing group of people. And over the years, I have seen the body of Christ visible in the world 
every week they pray through every prayer request we receive at Calvary. Your deacons do this. They make calls on people who are lonely. They send cards to the grieving and the newly born. They bring food to the sick. They hold someone's hand as they go on to the next world. They bring communion to a long lost member of the fold. They sing hymns with a complete stranger who's overheard them giving communion to their roommate. They make a new home for wayward animals, birds especially. They connect homeless people with services and new socks. And they make an entrance like Jesus. They make an entrance in immigration court and they sit there just to bear witness. You'd be amazed how better things go when you have people. Deacons say yes, where others have said, uh, maybe not now, I just can't. Over the past so many decades, this church has had a parish-based ministry and through discernment with co-moderators and the deacons over the past few years, we determined that we needed to reform our ministry into a teams-based ministry. You will hear about this after worship. We hope to respond to your needs more readily. And if you need a deacon, you'd merely have to say so. Now, if you're going to come meet the deacons after worship and you're already signed up, good for you. Thank you. If you still want to uh, sign up, there is time. Just know that David Barnes is working as fast as he can to assign you to a breakout session. So uh, we will see you after worship. I want to thank Calvary for supporting me supporting our pastoral staff and supporting the deacons. It is an honor to do ministry in an institution of 160 something years. And for all of you who do the work of Christ in your own lives, in your neighborhood, in your families, in your building, Hosanna, blessed are you who come and do work in the name of the Lord. You bring good news to those who are in need. You proclaim liberty to captives. You provide the recovery of sight to the spiritually blind and sweet liberty to those who are oppressed. Working together, I have no doubt that this is the year of our God's favor. May you be blessed on this Palm Sunday. Amen.